Um, indeed, this is a joint work with uh, Louis Salval from the uh, University of Montreal. So I'm going to talk about encryption and authentication with uh, information theoretic security. A uh, typical example of such an encryption scheme is the one-time pad that we all know. Uh, authentication, on the other hand, can be done, for instance, by means of universal hashing, and uh, this is sort of the typical choice of such universal hash function. Now, the obvious downside with such schemes that offer information theoretic security is that the key cannot be reused, right? I mean, in the one-time pad, you can use the key only once. In general, you can only use the key a bounded number of times. And it's quite easy to see why this is the case. An adversary, if, can simply learn observation on the key just by observing the communication. Ciphertext in the case of encryption, the tag in the case of authentication. So if you keep reusing the key, uh, if will accumulate more and more information on the key and will eventually know it. There's nothing we can do about that. What's even worse about this is that such a passive eavesdropping attack remains undetected. So this means even if we're not under attack, we cannot reuse the key, even though it would be perfectly fine. It would still be perfectly secure, but we don't know that we were not under attack. Now, this change is a bit if we go to the quantum setting, because if we think of a quantum cipher text, then by, well, fundamental properties of quantum mechanics, uh, any eavesdropping attack will disturb the state, right? So we may hope for a scheme where we sort of encode the ciphertext into a quantum state, which we can then check on our arrival if it's still in good form, and if it is to conclude that no eavesdropping took place, and so the key is still safe to use again. <coughs> so this would allow for non-bounded safe reuse of the key as long as we are not under attack, and well, as soon as we are under attack, there's not much we can hope for. So that's the general idea, and this idea is not new. It's not new at all. It actually goes back to 1982, uh, when uh, Bennett, Brasser, and Breitbart proposed this idea together with a simple scheme and some hand wavy arguments that their scheme uh, does the job. <coughs> However, their paper got rejected, and then they abandoned the idea because instead they came up with Q QKD instead. Until then, in 2005, when Domgar, Peterson, and Salweil picked up on this idea again, and they proposed a new scheme for uh, encryption with key recycling, but now together with a rigorous security proof. However, in their scheme, they're using a more sophisticated quantum encoding scheme, uh, which in particular means that the honest users, in order to honestly execute the scheme, they need to have quantum computing capabilities. And, well, our result is a new simple scheme, a scheme very much in the spirit of the original scheme by uh, Bennett et al., particular only uses uh, BB84 qubits, and so it doesn't require any quantum computing capabilities from the honest users to honestly execute the scheme. And, of course, our scheme also comes along with a rigorous security proof. Uh, quickly, I want to mention a related line of work on... on why is this thing here blinking? Uh, let me see if I can get rid of this. Uh. <coughs> okay. So I quickly want to mention a related uh, line of work on uh, encryption and authentication of quantum messages. So where the message that we want to protect is a quantum state. Because some of these uh, schemes also offer key recycling features, but in all these schemes it's also the case that the honest users, in order to execute the scheme, need to have quantum computing capabilities, even if we restrict uh, the message to be classical. Um, I want to say one quick word about encryption with key recycling versus quantum key distribution, because you may wonder, well, why do we even bother about reusing the key, given that you have quantum key distribution, which allows us to produce a fresh key whenever we want. And indeed, I mean, at the end of the day, both concepts achieve quite a similar thing. Uh, there are some subtle technical differences that will, will make one or the other the preferred choice, depending on uh, precise setting on circumstances. But my, our main motivation was mainly, well, of intellectual interest, because, I mean, that's a problem that was proposed as one of the very first uh, ideas of how to use quantum mechanics in the context of crypto. And more than 30 years later, we still didn't really have a satisfactory solution. Okay, 
So the purpose of this presentation, I present our scheme here. I'm going to focus on the authentication scheme. Building encryption on top of it is not going to be too hard anymore. Um, so our scheme is extremely simple, as you're going to see on this slide here. <clears throat> so the key, the key that Alice and Bob share consists of two parts. One part I call theta, the other part I call k, and they're going to play slightly different roles in the scheme, as you'll see. Now, in order to authenticate a message M that Alice sends to Bob, so with the goal that Bob will detect if an active adversary Eve uh, changes this message, Alice does the following. She chooses a uniformly random bit string X. She codes it into qubits well, using standard BB84 encoding, uh, where she uses theta, the first part of the key, for the choice of the basis. Hmm? And then she sends these qubits to Bob, along with an authentication tag on the message concatenated with this randomness x. So this is a, a, a classical uh, message authentication code uh, for concreteness, also because I'm going to use some special property of that construction. Just think of this standard construction, where the key consists of a matrix A and a vector B, and the tag is computed by, well, by means of this affine function applied to the message, which in this case is the actual message together with this randomness X. Huh? And well, Bob, P does the Yes, yes, yes. It's sort of a, a vector with m on top and, and x on, on the lower. Yes, it's not a fraction, indeed. Thank you, Claude. M is a class function? Yes, yes. Coming from where? From Alice. So m is the message that Alice wants to communicate to Bob in an authenticated way. And we're just talking about classical messages in, in, in my well, in our result. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So the only thing that is quantum here are these uh, qubits here. Okay. So what Bob does is sort of the obvious. Uh, he measures the qubits in the right basis to recover x, and then he can verify the correctness of, of, of the tag here. Hmm? <coughs> so very simple scheme. What can I say about the security? Well, I mean, first, it's obvious to see that it offers authentication security. Well, at least as long as the key uh, that is used for the classical message authentication code is fresh enough, right? Because I'm using a classical authentication code that is promised to, do, to protect the message, that it's promised to protect the message as long as the key K is uh, fresh. What is less obvious to see is that the, that the key stays fresh if Bob accepts, so that they can reuse the same key again uh, uh, to authenticate the second message, the third message, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, this is not obvious. I mean, this is what we have to prove. Finally, if Bob rejects, then in general, there's not that much that we can hope for, because then Eve may have gained information on the key, so certainly some refreshing has to take place, but we can show it's good enough to refresh theta only, whereas the other part of the key K can still be reused. <coughs> okay, I want to give... Uh, First, a high-level intuition of why we may hope for this uh, key recycling property. Even though the scheme uses sort of a classical one-time secure message authentication code, which in a classical setting would not allow us to reuse the key. The point is that, well, in a classical setting, if Eve gets to see authentication tags like this for a fixed key, and different known messages, she accumulates linear information on the key. She accumulates linear information on well, the, the entries of A and B, and so over time she'll be able to solve and obtain, recover the key. But now the point here is, here the message is partly unknown to Eve because it also includes X, which is sort of hidden behind the qubits, behind the BBA qubits, for Eve, who doesn't know the basis theta. I mean, that's sort of the, the intuition way we may hope for, that, that these tags, in our case, don't leak information on the key because Eve has uncertainty in the messages here, in these coefficients of these linear equations, if you wish. But of course, it's just uh, intuition. Now, before I go make things more formal, I want to quickly discuss a attack. Now I have attack in quotation mark because it's not an attack that breaks the scheme. 
claiming that the scheme is secure and we're proving the scheme secure. It's just something that if can do, and I think it's insightful to see what happens in, if we're under this kind of attack. Uh, so I have the scheme here as I had it on the previous slide, except that I'm spelling out here the individual qubits. Now the attack is as follows. If simply measures the first qubit in the computational basis, and then she leans back and, and observes what's going to happen. So let's see what's going to happen then. Now, well, if the first qubit had been paired in the computational basis, which is the case if theta 1 is 0, then if measuring that qubit in the computational basis doesn't disturb the state. So everything is going to look fine on Bob's side and it's going to accept. Right? On the other hand, if the first qubit had been prepared in the Hadamard basis, then if measuring that qubit in the computational basis will disturb the qubit, to the effect that Bob is going to reject, reject with probability one half. Right. So now this means from Eve's perspective, if Bob rejects, then she knows theta one must have been one. Right. So she has learned one bit information on the key. But we don't need to worry because Bob rejects and then the scheme instructs them to refresh theta. I mean, they know if Bob rejects, they have to refresh theta. So the bit of information she has just learned well becomes immediately useless to her again. On the other hand, if Bob accepts, then theta 1, well, it may be both. may still be 0 or 1, but it's easy to see that it's more likely to be 0. So even in that case, Eve has learned, well, sort of a fraction of a bit of information on the key. And now, since Bob has accepted, they're going to reuse the key. But we don't have to worry about this, at least intuitively, because the more information Eve tries to gain on the key by repeating this attack, well, eventually she's going to get caught. Because every time she launches this attack, she'll get caught with probability one half. Well, I mean, Bob will reject with probability one half. And as soon as Bob rejects, all the information that Eve has gained on theta becomes useless, because then theta is going to be replaced, refreshed. Huh? <coughs> So, I mean, this attack sort of shows nicely what we cannot expect to be able to formally prove. We cannot expect to be able to prove a statement of the form, if Bob accepts, then the key stays uh, uh, close to, to uniformly random. Because I mean, we've just seen this is actually not the case. But the point is, it's not necessary for the key to stay uniformly at random. Uh, it's going to be good enough for the key to have sufficient uncertainty. And this insight, I think, explains why in the previous work by Domgard et al., they didn't manage to deal with the qubit-wise encoding because they were heading for a security statement of that form. And whenever you have a qubit-wise encoding, you can always launch this kind of attack, and then you're, you're, you're not going to get this kind of statement. <coughs> OK, so formally what we can prove, and we, what we prove in the paper is the following. If before the execution of the scheme, the key satisfies the following two properties. So first, we want that Eve's guessing probability on theta is small, which means it, I mean, it sounds slightly weaker than theta being close to uniformly random. But again, I mean, this is not something we can expect. So if Eve's guessing probability on theta is small, and k is close to uniformly random given theta and Eve's all side information. If these two properties hold before the execution of the scheme, <coughs> then they still hold after the execution of the scheme. We we'll take it as understood that after the execution of the scheme, I'll consider theta prime here, which is the original theta if Bob accepted and replaced by a fresh choice if Bob rejected. So we have this invariant that stays alive after every execution, which in particular ensures that the k part of the key that is used for the classical authentication code stays fresh enough so the classical authentication code, authentication code that we use within our scheme keeps on doing its job in protecting the message. OK, so I do want to walk you through the easy part of the proof. For that, let's first note that, well, slightly simplified Eve's view after the execution of the scheme consists of her old view before the execution of the scheme, the classical authentication tag T that was communicated as part of the scheme, whatever quantum information she keeps on the BB84 qubits that are also communicated during the execution of the scheme, and Bob's decision to accept or reject. So with this, we can then write out 
uh, if guessing probability after the execution like this here, this we can then decompose into the case where Bob rejects and the case where Bob accepts. Now in case Bob rejects, theta prime is freshly chosen. In case he accepts, theta prime equals theta. But of course, if theta prime is freshly chosen, then the guessing probability is just one over possible choices for theta. And here I'm using a basic property of the guessing probability that <laughs> states that if that conditioning on an event, here on the event that Bob accepts, cannot increase the guessing probability by more than the inverse of this event, uh, with the inverse of the probability of the event, which will then cancel out with this thing here. OK, now here I notice that T is computed, well, something plus something uniformly random independent of the rest. So T here is uniformly random in the temp independent of the rest, so it doesn't contribute to the guessing probability. Q, on the other hand, is a whatever quantum information if kept on the BB84 qubits. It's not going to be more useful to her than the original BB84 qubits before sort of she decided what to keep on it and what not. But now here, you see x is chosen uniform yet random independent of the rest. So this is the completely mixed state independent of the rest. So also doesn't contribute to the guessing probability. So now we see that if the guessing probability before the execution is small, then the guessing probability after the execution is small. Assuming that theta is chosen from a large enough set. So that's sort of one part of the proof, the easier part of the proof. The other part of the proof where we have to control k is, is, is sort of more, more involved. Here we're using techniques from an older paper of uh, uh, Marco, Chet, Stefania, myself. OK. Um, the other that sort of settles our authentication scheme. As I mentioned, it's quite easy to extend it to an encryption scheme. And uh, we can also extend the scheme to a variant that tolerates a certain amount of noise in the quantum communication. Now here things aren't too easy, and I'll say a couple of words about that on the next slide, uh, but we can sort of circumvent uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> the issues you run into if you want to do their correction in a naive way by using more sophisticated techniques uh, introduced by Dotis and Smith uh, what, some time ago. So now the problem with the Error correction is the following. I mean, the obvious solution would just be to send along a syndrome of x. So that if Bob measures a noisy version of x, he can use that syndrome to recover the, the, the correct x here. If you use sort of a syndrome with respect to a suitably chosen error correcting code. Now the problem is, if we then go through this analysis I had just a couple of slides before, well, now the syndrome is also, when I mean, Eve learns the syndrome, so Eve is, uh, syndrome is also going to be part of Eve's view after the execution, so I have to condition on the syndrome as well. <coughs> but then if I go through this analysis, when I get to the point when I argue that I can sort of, well, remove this from the guessing probability because x is chosen uniformly at random, that's not true anymore. Conditioned on the syndrome, conditioned on the syndrome of x, x is not uniformly random anymore. So we don't really know how to get rid of uh, this thing here then. Now, well, if you well, understand what this guessing probability captures, it's quite clear it should still be small, but you don't know how to prove it. But then again, we can use these more sophisticated techniques, which though only allow for a smaller amount of noise to circumvent this, this, this problem, well, at least in, in, in principle. Okay, so uh, this brings me to my conclusion. So what we did is we considered one of the very first ideas of how to use quantum mechanics in the context of crypto and how to circumvent the classical impossibility result with the help of using effects from quantum mechanics. It was a, an idea suggested more than 30 years ago, even before quantum key distribution was invented. And now we prove the first, well, we show the first provably secure solution that doesn't require quantum computing capabilities. A uh, challenging open problem is to do the error correction in a better way, to do the error correction sort of in the straightforward way. I mean, we feel it should work, but somehow our techniques don't, or we don't know how to prove it. Uh, this would give us, well, a simpler scheme, but also would allow us to tolerate more noise in the communication because these sort of more sophisticated error correction techniques only work for a small amount of noise. And also from a practical perspective, it would of course be nice to minimize the amount of quantum communication that is necessary for the scheme to work. Thank you.